honor to speak to an audience like you all, a gathering of um, a group of engineers. One of my ambitions in my professional life is to impart the knowledge and the experience that I have gained over a few decades to the younger generation. And this series fit in with that idea. Today's topic is bridge engineering and an introduction to bridge engineering. Now, the aim of this uh, lecture is to produce practical bridge engineers to effectively manage our bridges, design aspect of it, the construction aspect of it, and the asset management, and also bridge structural assessment and non-destructive bridge load testing, which I have developed for Australia. And these techniques that we learn is applicable world over. And also I must say there is a shortage of bridge engineers. I can speak on behalf of Australia. Yeah, there's a big shortage as well as in most of the Western countries, such as the United States, um, uh, United Kingdom, um, Germany, and France. Now, look at, in order to understand the bridges, we have to uh, understand why roads are vital connection. The roads are vital to bind the communities together. Now, before the roads came into being, people live in small villages and they only exchange ideas, views, only within that community because they could move. And the very first bridge was, uh, they couldn't even cross rivers. So, but people got an idea, there was a fallen tree or they cut a tree, just put across the river or a creek, and that was the first bridge that came about many centuries ago. So as the, the bridge, uh, the road system developed, people start to move everywhere. Now, Australia is a continent, but we have six states and people move around. We have um, the road network in Australia is about uh, 60,000 kilometers. So, I'm sorry, it's 800,000 800, uh, uh, kilometers and uh, so people started to move around and people start to exchange ideas now on top of that as we all know now people start to fly so the ideas not only uh, now move because of the road system within a country the ideas started to spread all around the world and the globe became small now condition of roads and bridges are a measure of Civilization, the country's civilization, economy. Um, it also ensures the social cohesiveness and it facilitates commerce. This has been true from ancient times and it is just as important today. So if you visit to a country, you'll see that if the road network is good, that means the country's economy is good. And all these are tied together as we go through this talk you will see why. Moving on to the next one. How bridge, how bridges connect communities. Now, in order to understand that, we have to understand the road network because bridges link the roads. You can have kilometers and kilometers of road, but without one fiddly little bridge, that whole road network, that particular network, you cannot get the full use of it. So it is road network. The bridges are a very vital component of the road network. Then we have to understand the freight haulage, how these trucks have become bigger and bigger and still getting bigger. Then the different type of vehicle loads and also and understand the evolution and the development of bridge types. So I have made an attempt to give you at least an idea or create an interest within you so that 
you can cover them or you can search uh, research for them and uh, and uh, learn introduction to bridge asset continuing if you look at the transport cost in any country the average transport cost is 20 percent of our average household expenditure when i say that whatever you eat your food whatever you buy your clothing anything that is attributed 20 to 25 percent is due to transport. I think Sri Lanka had recently the issues with fuel, and you saw how the cost escalated. So uh, it is very important that we keep our uh, transport industry at, at a very high efficient level. And how can we keep that? We have to have our road infrastructure efficient. Now, I have been to, uh, in Colombo um, last February, this last month, and what I notice is in Colombo during peak hours, it's a gridlock. Now people don't move, they can't move. So what happens? We that has a very bad effect, a detrimental effect on global warming, because we are burning fossil fuel for nothing, and then. The other is we sit on a car or a bus or a train and we that is the productive time. So the country productivity drops. Therefore, that affects the economy. So in various ways, it is going to affect the economy. So we have to be very vigilant in have to have the very efficient road infrastructure system. And in Australia and many countries, like primary petroleum and manufacturing industries. Tourism, now tourism applies to Sri Lanka. That is something that we can thrive and earn a, a good income from tourism, get the foreign exchange that is needed. But without the proper system, it's very difficult because people can't travel that freely. Then of course, there are countries like um, Australia mining and also, in order to move the construction equipment, we have to have the proper road system. So those are the main things um, that requires the, benefit, the imp improvement to road network. Therefore, for maximum economic benefits to be realized, it is important that there may be certain bridges that has limiting capacities. I don't know, you all might know better in Sri Lanka, you, whether you have got limiting, the bridge may be narrow or bridge may be not, may be able to carry heavy loads. We had uh, quite a lot in Australia and uh, we, we we managed to test them, we managed to do various things that is necessary and, and allow high loads on them. I'm sure Sri Lanka would have the same. Then manage, Management strategies need to be developed to identify and prioritize bridges and bridge type, which are perceived as weak links in a road system. You might identify certain type of bridges being weak, maybe weak because of a load carrying capacity, or it may have other traffic issues, safety issues, the bridge may be not wide enough. So we have to develop strategies. How can we improve to carry more higher loads or how can we improve the width of the bridge? So those that is what I mean by management strategies. And also develop cost-effective options for these under effect, understrength bridges to be either strengthened. The strengthening option may not be cost-effective, in which case, don't go down that path. Then you have to replace it with a new bridge. But various options are available to bridge engineers. They should understand that. And we should then do a cost analysis and determine what is the best cost-effective uh, option, whether to strengthen or to replace. Current status of bridges in Australia. At the current rate that uh, we are constructing, 
Australia would take 130 years to replace the infrastructure, even if only the replacement bridges were built. So we have to have different strategies. Some of our bridges, I will show some examples as we go along, are over, 10, are over 100 years old. But they are still serving today and uh, for to carry legal loads. And they are integral part of our aging $50 billion bridge asset. The, bill, the value of the bridge asset under RTA, that is the bridges that was under my control, which I was responsible for, the value of the, the bridge stock is over $18.5 billion. If you look at historically in Australia, the bridge design live loads have increased steadily at a rate of approximately 10% every 10 years. And this is true of other Western countries like America and United Kingdom. Um, you might not understand how the, uh, the loads in Sri Lanka has grown. Then I think it is best that we understand the different bridge types and different methods and co concepts of design and construction. In order to do that, it is best that we understand the terminal, various terminology that is applicable to bridges. Then we will quickly have a look at different type of bridges, different type of construction methods. How do we select the bridge type? And for examples, what we call here super T bridge construction, super T uh, beam methods. Then if you look at the terminology, you, the length of a bridge is here, you can see in red, the length is from the end of the deck, which is passed uh, from the beginning of the abutment to the other abutment. That's, the, that's what we uh, define as length. And a span is from a set of bearings, the, for example, bearings underneath, um, bearings uh, uh, over the abutment. On the left-hand side, you can see that that is where the bearings would be, from there to the bearings at the pier. That is a span. So the, that is the difference between the length of the bridge and the span of a bridge. Then the next one is what is superstructure and what is substructure. The superstructure is from the top of the railing right to the bottom of the girder. If it's a girder bridge like this one, that is where the girder sits at the bearing. So from the bearing up to the barriers. Then the substructure is where the bearings are located. So uh, just underneath the bearing, right up to their foundation. So this one, the foundation is not seen, but if there are piles, the piles also consist of part of substructure. This will give, give a clearer picture and this will give you the components. So you see the here, the bearings, you see the abutment here, and this is the embankment that prevents the fill getting into the waterway in this particular bridge. And you see the piles here. So the sub substructure is from underneath the bearing right to the where piles are, uh, uh, where piles are, are bearing. Then this is the foundation. This is the foundation for the pier. And this is the foundation for the abutment. And this is the abutment. And this is the, the wing wall. These wing walls, abutment wing walls, prevent the fill getting onto the side of the bridge. Now here you can see these are called crossheads or headstocks. These ones with the red arrow, they are the 
either called crossheads or cross girders. A bit of a head, I beg your pardon, crosshead or uh, headstock. Uh, the, the, then the primary function of a bridge bearing, we have to understand, because most of the time, because it's such a small compound, even bear, uh, the bridge engineers in their earlier careers, because you, they did, bearing is something that is not predominantly visible like other components, you tend to ignore that. But no, even though it is small, it is visually not very prominent, it is very, very important, particularly in the maintenance and the during the life of that of a of a bridge. The transfer of floats coming from the superstructure to the substructure is through the bearing. And that is how the superstructure loads are being transferred to the substructure. And also that is one function. The other function is end up relative movements between the superstructure and the substructure. They are life structure. They are moving all the time. So the bear bearings have to be designed to adjust for translational and rotational movement. The translational movement might take place due to creep, shrinkage, and temperature. So that the mostly those are in the longitudinal direction. Then on top of that, you have you have wind coming in. Wind comes from the side. And so you get the, the transverse direction movement. So the bearing should be able to take longitudinal as well as trans, uh, transverse. Then the other is braking. When a vehicle brakes, then there's a longitudinal force. That is then taken up by the bearing from the deck or the superstructure and is transferred to the to the substructure. The other is it should be when it when the temperature moves, it tends to bend because the the uh, temperature of the deck deck top is higher than the bottom. So what happens is you get that um, there's like a warping of the deck, and that. Also, you, the bearing should be able to take that rotation. So it should be able to rotate. Again, rotate in all directions and translate into two directions, longitudinally and transversely. And also, you know, this, due to concrete bridges particularly, you have the creep. Con concrete, um, once it is stressed, it will start to creep and shrink. And as a result, they will start to shorten. So that sh shortening, the longitudinally, you have to take. And how do you take it? It is through the bearings. So the bearings should be capable of translational and rotational movements. Concrete barriers. This is very important. And, uh, you know, the, in order to contain the vehicles, it is the, how you design is if a car or a, a truck hits the barrier, it is then rather than the car getting crushed, it is deflected back to the traffic lane. But in doing so, you get again forces in depending on the angle that uh, at which the vehicle hits the barrier, you can get longitudinal forces as well as trans transverse forces, which again will have to be um, carried by the bearings. And, and also, uh, in the, you carry that you should be able to take that deformation, bearing should be able to take that deformation and then um, induce those forces to the substructure. Noise walls. Now, noise walls are an essential part particularly when we do construction, design and construct of uh, bridges on uh, freeways or motorways, it goes through, sometimes it, it has to go through urban areas where there is high density of people living. 
So we have to minimize that noise resulting from the traffic rather than you know passing on to the houses. So these noise walls will tend to deflect the noise and retain the noise within the traffic lanes. So it will minimize that noise being imparted outside. But those, those noise walls have to be designed also for a certain amount of impact, traffic impact, as well as for wind. And again, coming from this results longitudinal as well as transverse movements and forces where the bearings will have to carry and transfer to substructure. Just to get some uh, more details and definitions, concrete deck, you see those red arrows, that's the concrete deck. And the substructure is from the, the headstock right to the, um, in this particular case, pier footing. And if there are piles, it goes, substructure is defined right to the piles. And uh, the deck is the area that the traffic is on. And from the from the traffic rails or the from the traffic rails right down to the top of bearings, that is what we define as superstructure. This is a particular bridge that we built, um, what called Coots Crossing Bridge. This is all out of out of composite. Um, it's not a concrete bridge. We probably designed this about 20 years ago and constructed it as a trial bridge. And at the beginning, we want to understand the creep and the shrinkage and the durability. We tested the bridge in the first year, every six months, then uh, if, uh, yearly for two years, and after that five years. And now we, um, Generally, we all our bridges we inspect uh, every two years, but this particular one, what we call level two inspection, all our bridges are we inspect every two years. But this particular one, the, the level three, that is a structural inspection, we do fairly regularly because we wanted to study uh, about the creep and shrinkage and the durability of. Uh, uh, fiber composite bridges. Again, different type of expansion joints. You see the expansion. This is another thing. The component which a lot of uh, engineers try to not give enough emphasis because it's a small component. The, for the value of the bridge, this co the, the value of this component is small, but it is not the case. Even though the value is, if you are to replace this once the bridge is open to traffic, is going to care, uh, uh, resource chaos because we can't willy-nilly stop. We have to have the community informed that the bridge will be closed. And you cannot close the bridge at peak hours and it's going to be costly. So we have to choose the right bearings, the right um, expansion joint for the bridge. And it has to be designed to take all the as we discussed earlier, bridges have lateral movement as well as longitudinal movement. We don't want to get these um, expansion joints jammed as a result of transverse or longitudinal, or even if uh, rotation. If it is rotation, this this what we call these expansion joints. You have the tooth that can protrude out, and therefore it is a danger to traffic. So that is, even though it is a very small component, we have to think and select the right one and it has to be conservatively designed. And the other thing is we have to think how we are going to, what is the life expectancy of this component? We design bridges for 100 years, but these expansion joints and bearings won't last for that long. Therefore, we have to think, how are we going to replace this during the life of this bridge? both the bearings as well as the expansion joints. Bridge abutment, 
So these are again, you can see the here the pile cap of the abutment, the piles here, and you see the normal water. This is, this is what the bed fits the river. Then this is the bed level, and uh, which I won't get the, uh, the opportunity to go through. Um, you have to design the waterway, otherwise the bid, uh, bridge will be over top, or bridge will get eroded. All this area the, behind the abutment, you will lose that, and ultimately um, you might even lose the bridge. So it has to be properly designed, and these are the you have to know what is the deck level, um, and what is the normal water level, and the bed level, and also what is the high flood level, which I haven't um, drawn up here. So high flood level, there must be enough clearance when you have this deck, the level, to determine the deck level, you should know how much water will go, one in 100 year flood, and would it carry debris? And the other, which I forgot to mention, is when there's um, a flood, the river will bring some of the trees and uh, the, those big trees will impact on this. So that is the debris forces, which gives an enormous, huge um, lateral force on the bridge. And as a result, lateral force on the bearings, which will be transmitted to abutments and piers. This um, different type of um, co the components. Um, you see, the, that's a pile cap. This is the pier. Like, um, so this is the pier cap or a cross girder. Uh, the pile cap and the piles. Again, we talked about wing walls. The wing wall prevents the earth fill. You have to fill the uh, earth in order to get the come onto the bridge. And uh, these big walls will prevent that earth getting onto the, the uh, sides of the bridge. Um, overview of bridge types. You have various type of bridges and you have got the truss bridges, you get the arch bridges, Box girder will go, will go through very quickly. And uh, box girder, different types, steel with orthotropic decks, box girder, concrete, um, with in-situ balance ca uh, cantilevers, then box girder, segmental balance cantilever, uh, various dip, uh, with vary varying depth. And uh, we'll understand this when we go through some of these examples and we uh, see some uh, photos box girder, uh, concrete segmental balance cantilever. We have balance cantilevers with um, constant depth as well as varying depth. Then box girders, concrete launch uh, box girders. Then we have box girders, composite steel with a concrete deck, box girders, concrete, uh, full span precast, which is fairly rare, box girders, concrete segment, um, and it is called segmental span by span construction. Plate girders, we'll see some examples of them, and beam, concrete beam girders, concrete slabs, we'll go through a few examples of wider slabs, concrete, pre-stressed concrete planks, and solid concrete in situ. Um, Decks. This is the suspension bridge in the United States in East Coast. Um, and uh, it's 1.28 kilometers long. It was constructed in 1937. It had few issues at various times during, uh, during earthquakes. I was lucky to travel from, uh, I walked on this bridge about seven years ago, from one end to the other. It's a fantastic bridge. And you see very quickly, I was trying to uh, uh, give an idea of how the load is carried. 
Here you see the deck here. Deck is being uh, hung by these suspension cables. This so the this load, the self weight of the deck plus the traffic load is taken by these hangers, which are tendons, and then it is transmitted to the uh, uh, sus the cables suspended cable, and then cable goes through the tower, pier tower, and as a result, you get this reaction. And that is how this reaction coming down is being supported by the substructure, the piers, and the, and the uh, generally in a situation like this, you'll have to have a lot of piles, and finally the piles will transmit the load onto the starter. This is uh, again a suspension bridge. Akasai uh, in Japan is built in 1991, no, sorry, built in 1998, and uh, it is one point, nearly two kilometers long. So it's longer than the Golden Gate. But again, see the, how the reaction is coming to the piers, the same, same sort of philosophy or the articulation and the transfer of loads. This is another type which we call cable state bridges. This is a um, Ruski bridge. It is 1.1 kilometers long, constructed in 2012. And here you see, similar to the, the, the suspension bridge, where it was taken by vertical hangers. Here, the cables are at an angle. And again, the deck weight plus the traffic load is taken by these cables and the cables are anchored onto this pier. And uh, this tension in the cable resolves this reaction and this uh, reaction is then resisted by the pier uh, with the pars and the, ultimately the pars transfer the load onto the, the whatever the stratum is. This is one of our bridges, um, ANSAC Bridge, which I was also involved. And uh, the ANSAC Bridge uh, was uh, constructed in two uh, 1995. And uh, we had some issues because that is the time the, the, uh, this type of bridges uh, were constructed. And this bridge had issue in the sense when we have a uh, like a drizzle, a light rain and the wind, the bridge used to uh, have a movement, transverse movement, nearly uh, one and a half meters. So, but a certain, it has to be, there must be a light rain, like a drizzle, and then there must be a certain wind. High wind, no problem. There's a light wind and light um, rain causes the bridge to move sideways, about one and a half meters. And what we did was, you can see here, in these cables, we put a bead. The tendons are covered by a plastic uh, tube. And that, that plastic tube was smooth. What happened was the raindrops, when it's a light rain, get adhered to this and put, create like a vortex. And there is that vortex wind going through that causes the side movement. And that is uh, why the bridge was moving um, nearly one and a half meters sideways. But once we put the beads along this, that interrupted the, the water flowing through that. And also the wind, it was, it, it was not going, the, the surface was not smooth. So it was not going through smoothly. So that completely changed the resonance and we managed to eliminate that lateral movement with the philosophy was simple, but it took a while to, for us to research and find out what needs to be done. 
This is the Itosuki Bridge, 14 meter uh, span, and 1991, it was constructed in 1991. It is similar to the bridge that collapsed a few days ago in the United States. And in Australia, got really worried and they interviewed me both on television and on, uh, on the press to see whether we have got such bridges and are, are we vulnerable to such. So I have to assure them that our bridges, we don't have this type of thing. Now see here in this, the middle pier is exactly what happened in the, and this a similar thing was hit by a boat. And by the way, that boat was coming to Australia, uh, to, from, Austria, from the United States to Colombo. So, and it was a very heavily laden and it, it lost the power. So the, the captain couldn't maneuver it. And just imagine where such a huge vessel, no control, it will go anywhere. And luckily, there were only the uh, maintenance, but even one life is is we can, uh, is so valuable. But normally, this bridge carries 30,000 vehicles a day. So if it was different time of the day, then it would have been, the catastrophe would have been unimaginable. So this is something. Now, there here you can see some fenders in this bridge, but that is where a lesson to for all of us. But we have done similar bridges. We have designed either the the pier to take the force from the impact of the ship, or we have de de designed a separate fender system around it so that the boat will hit the fenders and absorb the energy before it hits the pier. So I thought that would be that's a good example for uh, bridge engineers to understand. This is one of our bridges, which does um, the arch is 300 meter span. It was constructed in 1964. It's a pre-stressed concrete bridge. And uh, see, this is again navigational, but there is enough clearance here. And here the the bearings, this is a uh, two pin arch, concrete arch, but the pins are anchored uh, well away from the river. And we are lucky we have sandstones, very strong sandstone. The whole of Sydney Basin is on uh, what we call Sydney sandstone, which is fairly strong. And we have anchored these bearings on Sydney sandstone. And see here, the, these are the columns, the capillas. This is the headstock. These are the pier columns. The vertical load is transferred to this compression member arch, pre-stress concrete arch. So these are, um, at the time it was constructed, it was the largest concrete arch, but not anymore. I think it is um, the second largest even now. Some similar arches. This is the 90 meter span. Box gutter bridges. So you see the, the whole thing. Generally, you precast them either in a casting yard or um, depending on the situation, the clo very close to the site. And this is very good if you have uh, constant curvature. See how this bridge is curved? And you can take that curvature uh, and with the segments cast accordingly. The geometry um, is, is fairly easy for casting. This is the box girder, steel with orthotopic deck. You can see this deck, it's all, uh, it's like a composite steel, all steel. And uh, this is not being used now, but I think it was in the early 1900s, there were a lot of steel orthotopic um, box girders being used. Box girder bridges, um, composite, no, um, Composite steel and concrete. Now, this is the composite steel and concrete. This is actually a trough. It is a steel trough. It becomes a box when you put a concrete topping. 
So what you have to do is put form work and put false work. The form work is uh, you put uh, um, form work inside the box uh, inside the trough, and then you put the full uh, false work inside the box and the form work on top. Then you cast the concrete, and then it becomes a composite steel trough becomes a, a composite reinforced concrete and steel box girder. Composite uh, steel and concrete, uh, these are plate girders. You can see the plate girder. And then uh, this is the girder depth. You can see this red arrow. That's the girder depth. And what you call unbraced length. There is a bracing here. And the other bracing here, this is the unbraced. And that is uh, important to know why I thought I would highlight that in designing this, uh, the depth length is important to prevent buckling. So if the longer this length is, then the each individual will uh, uh, beam, plate fed girder, will try to buckle. So that is where you have to design at what space, space should we have these uh, bracings. And again, this is the overhang concrete part. And uh, this is the internal girder. And this is the external girder. Concrete bridges. Now, this, these are pre stress girders. And then you erect them. And then, then you put the uh, false work and the form work. And then you ask the concrete slab. Again, this is the cross section of a uh, uh, priestess concrete eye girders. This type of the construction happened, uh, I think, um, early 19, uh, from 19, uh, 1950 to about 1980. But now we are not using it. It is an efficient way, uh, girders. The, there is a there's a work health and safety issue. When you put these girders, the girders tend to slide. That's one reason why we are not using that, unless there is no other uh, design, and that's the only design that we can use. So that's one reason. The other is you have to put form work between girders in order to pour the reinforced concrete deck. And in doing so, when you are erecting the formwork, people can fall through this. And again, the, uh, the girders can be wobbly. So we have to put cross braces here and stiffen them so that we, we tie the, all the girders together so that they cannot move. So that's the reason why we are, not, uh, we are trying to avoid the use unless it's, a, it's the only solution. This is the uh, improvement from that. Instead of an eye girder, you have a trough. Like the steel trough, this is a pre-stressed concrete trough girders. Uh, you, again, you place them, and then you put the foam work it, and uh, cast the concrete deck to make it composite with the trough girders. These are the slabs. This is what they call the wider slab. These are the voids that you have. The voids are there to reduce the concrete weight. Self weight is reduced. And this is very good if you have um, varying width of a bridge because you can easily, because it's done cast in place or cast in situ. So you can take any curvature and you can widen and narrow it as, as you would wish from the road geometry. This is, this is the voided slab. Again, these are the voids. Uh, that's a solid slab, which is very rare because it's of the weight. Uh, it's like a small culvert. And uh, small spans, you can do that, but we rarely do it now because it's not cost effective. This is the concrete slab bridges. These are the old reinforced concrete, 
which were done in uh, 19, the, the early 1940s. And these bridges are still there. They're holding well. And I must say our maintenance is good. So they are holding and carrying legal loads. Box the Bridge, this is the Gateway Bridge. The main span is 260 meters uh, they're long. And uh, th this is uh, uh, this is in uh, in Brisbane, and the Gateway Bridge was constructed. Uh, this, this the second one was constructed in 2012. The main span, as I said, is 260 meters, um, with uh, two side spans, 162 meters. And the whole length of the bridge, this whole length of this particular bridge is 1.62 kilometers. This has won many uh, awards. Then this is a very interesting um, construction, which is the cast in situ balance cantilever. You can see here, this is the, the one that is the, all the formwork is attached here. And it is attached onto the segment that is previously cast, and then you pull and move along. So, cast in place segmental constructed bridges are generally built using balance cantilever method. So, you have the pier, and then what you call, you build a, this one here, which is called hammerhead. And from there, you hang this cantilever weight, and then you uh, you support the formwork from one the, from that end, and the new concrete segment is poured. And then, uh, after that, it is post tensioned. Then the formwork travels to the opposite end of the cantilever, so it goes to the other side, and then you pour the other side, so that you keep on balancing. You add one on the left hand side, then you go to the right hand side, and do the same and pre stress until you come to the center. When you come to the center, then you connect them because, you, uh, and you have to put additional pre-stress. So you design separately and keep the, the ducts so that you can feed through and make it continuous once the bridges, the, once the, the two ends meet. Now, in the balanced cantilever method, the superstructure is erected by cantilevering out, as I said, from opposite side of the pier. The segments are added either at the same time, you can at the same time, and depending on the design, you can do it alternatively to each cantilever to maintain relatively balanced system. Often segments are offset by one and a half segments because you keep that uh, up your sleeve so that you have you can have room to play. The, after the cantilever from each adjacent pier reach the mid span, that's what I mentioned, um, cast in place, closure segment is placed, followed by additional post tensioning because the articulation changes from the cantilever system to a continuous bridge. Therefore, you have to have pre-stress cables going from abutment right to the other abutment. So then you will learn later, there'll be a lot of friction losses and things like that. But the principle, I just want to, in the introduction, to make you aware of the principles. This is a diagram. You can go through in detail how you go from one stage right to the end. The use of precast concrete segment has the advantage that the superstructure can be erected at a faster rate compared to the cast in place construction. The cast, the precast concrete segments, we can save time, are made while the substructure, while the substructure is being built in the casting yard, you can cast all these. And as soon as this is built, the substructures are built and it attains the required strength, then you bring along the segments and then keep on adding by uh, the balance cantilever method. So it is used uh, very commonly for long span bridges. Secret bridge. 
The total length of secret bridge is 642.4 meters. Uh, I, I was privileged to sign off this and approve this draw, uh, this design. And in order for to, for us to come to this um, this uh, design, we had we went through seven options, and uh, this is the final option we did various studies and uh, finally we came to this option which consists of five spans of pre-stressed concrete box girders built by balance cantilever. That's the method that we talked about and that is 449.6 meters long and the other seven spans are pre-stressed concrete double T's. It's like two T's and built by incremental launch. It was like a train that has been pushed. We'll see incremental launch at a, a little bit later. So that's the finally, uh, because of, you can see how the curvature of the bridge. So because of that, we have to have various options, seven options after seven, this is the one that was finally selected. And this won many awards. Type of bridges and age and condition. The bridge stock in any country is a legacy of the material, its design methods, and its construction methods, the, its environment, and the loads. What type of loads did that country had in the past? In Australia, I can talk about Australia. Our bridge stock is performing in general reasonably well, with failure due to vehicle loading being very rare and particularly in New South Wales, during my career with 49 years with the transport, um, we had one bridge that was because it didn't collapse. It was an old timber truss bridge. But you see here it's a, a, a steel trusses. We, this type of bridge, what we do, we get a lot of uh, maintenance issues. The heavy loads used to hit particularly the high loads used to hit these wind braces and uh, more often than not, we had to close the bridge and uh, immediately repair them, and remove it because being steel, it is easy to fix. We cut uh, the damage part and uh, while before it is being cut, we transfer the loads on either side of that member and then we cut it and put a new member and weld it or bolt it, depending on the circumstances. Yep, so bridge types and age and condition. Uh, timber beams, you can see here timber beam. These are the old, and Australia has got uh, very good hardwood timber. And that's why Australia, I think, is leading in this. We don't rebuild this type of bridges now, but in the early 40s, uh, 1940, uh, we uh, we did a lot of a lot of uh, timber beam bridges. When uh, until recently we had about 56 bridges timber beam, and we replaced those bridges uh, with uh, uh, dif different type of bridges. Then timber trusses came into being for long spans. And wrought iron, in the wrought iron, uh, I think it was in 1950s, uh, wrought iron came into being. Steel beams, uh, early 1900s, steel trusses, uh, again from uh, mid 1800s to mid 1900s. Bridge conditions depends on. Now, the, before we get into bridge condition, what we have to understand as bridge engineers is that as soon as we build a bridge and open it to traffic, it starts to deteriorate. One is because of the environment. So immediately the structure is imposed uh, to exposed to the environment as a result depending on the, the, where the environment is, you can have chemical uh, attacks like corrosion of steel because of chloride attack. 
then you can have concrete cancer because concrete being being attacked by chlorine. Then biological uh, timber bridges, you get like a fungus and uh, you can have the timber perishing. Then the other is uh, dependent the deterioration or the condition depends on time. The, you design a bridge for a certain load. The lighter the load, you can prolong the, the life of the bridge. But if you have heavier loads, that is what our bridge stock that we had to, because we were de we designed for bridges, uh, bridges um, before 1948, our design load was 16 tons. But our current uh, loading is 45 and a half tons. And legally we have to allow, we have to strengthen. So as a result, the deterioration is fast. So that's what I meant by that, the design loads. Then the other is high the load, you have the cumulative damage, what you call you as bridge engineers would know the fatigue issues, the community damage, and the other loads such as wind, uh, impact, debris impact, uh, coming from up with the flood, you get these big logs coming in and hitting the bridge sideways. Then earthquake, wind, and so on and so forth. You see the this is the on the left hand side is a timber truss bridge. On the right hand side is a timber beam, which is not that clear. The, all this is timber. This, this, this is the timber truss pier. Uh, here you can see the timber beam and the timber headstock, and you can see the pier piers here. Steel beam bridge. These are the steel beams. The longest of us, I thought to to make you interested uh, as bridge engineers. Those who are not, they might the, be interested in looking at and then be part of these uh, um, the world's longest bridges. This is the one in Japan. This is the world's uh, bridge. It's a causeway in uh, Louisiana in USA. Again, this one you can see it's a house going through along this bridge. And that uh, draws close to my talk. And what we use is A5100, uh, which was revised last uh, 2017. This is the bridge design code that is being used in Australia and New Zealand. And uh, I was uh, lucky and privileged to lead the team as the chairman of the, the code committee. And also uh, the OS roads, which all the road authorities, each state has a road authority and they are part of OS roads. OS roads is the governing body, which, um, all the roads authorities are represented uh, at OS roads, including New Zealand. So we have produced uh, bridge guidelines, technology guidelines. And these two, these are the two, if I may call colloquially a Bible for our design and our uh, maintenance work. Um, and most of the bridge, if, if you're a designer, this is a good textbook to have, is Bridge Deck Behavior by Hamley. That brings close to my talk and thank you very much for attention. Any questions, Randilni? Right. Anyone, anyone uh, does anyone in person have any questions? Uh, no questions currently, Professor Ari? Yeah, not a problem. Yeah, I hope uh, they, they uh, appreciated uh, the talk. We have one question coming in now. 
No, that's fine. Is there any recommended factor of safety to be applied in every design for the deterioration fatigue issues? Most softwares today still uh, does not consider the deterioration. Right. Uh, there are no, there are no, what you have to do is, that because why there are no factors is it depends, it varies from one location to the other. How we have the deterioration being addressed is when we design a bridge, we know where the bridge is going to be, whether we have got uh, coastal areas, high acidity areas, high um, uh, sulf high sulfate areas, and so on and so forth. So we select the material to suit that. So uh, the high, the, if it is a high sulfate, we use a particular cement that can resist sulfate reaction. So it is horses for courses, so it is very difficult to set a parameter. And when we have uh, one, that is how we address at the design stage. But once the bridge is built and it is in operation, what we have to do is, uh, of course, say we, we may have issues with corrosion. We may have issues with uh, alkaline aggregate reactions and concrete splitting. So what we have to do is we have to take samples and determine what is causing that and also take test um, air, air uh, samples to see what is there in the air. And therefore, we may have to take certain part of the concrete and use then patched with that. With a, and, and then we might have to go right to the uh, steel and we may even have to remove steel and add more steel. And when you're adding, we might either coat the steel before we're putting it, uh, depending on the extent of corrosion, or we, we might be able to go there and, and, and um, before that, we have to do a complete rigorous analysis and determine, okay, we have lost so much of steel, can it still carry the load? Or in which case can we take that steel and lap with uh, other steel. And in which case, what we will do is we will go to the steel, uh, take the concrete off right to the steel and even behind the steel and put, now there are various coatings available to prevent corrosion, put them and then put epoxy concrete to patch it up. So it is, as I said, it varies from site to site and depending on the site conditions. And that's why no, um, that, that, that cannot be addressed in a, in a code. Okay. Thank you, Professor Adi. We have a couple more questions. Uh, uh, we have one more. It's, uh, what kind of testing is usually conducted on bridges? Now, depending on the uh, loads, now we, um, Australia didn't have a load testing uh, methods. So in 1995, um, as I said, we had about 100 odd bridges, 160, if I may remember, which they I thought would be under capacity to increase the load from uh, the, the legal load from 16 tons to 45 and a half tons. And, but they want to do it, otherwise, uh, we would have lost the world market uh, with regard to our coal being called, being transported by big, huge vehicles. If I get the opportunity, I will show you the vehicles that we use now. They, are, they have uh, 12, sometimes 12 axles. So those loads, uh, they said, theoretically, when you analyze, can't carry. So I develop a method whereby you can start, you can test the bridge by putting, we create a, I created a, a design, the test truck where you can load that particular truck up to 120 tons. But how you do it is, you first do a rigorous analysis of that particular bridge and see if you keep on increasing, what are the modes of failure? And then we um, put strain gauges to, as we increase the load, to measure the strain. So what we did was we took that truck and started with a small load 
and went in increments every time seeing that that particular element that is supposed to be failing is operating within the linear elastic range. And uh, doing that test, we all the bridges which theoretically didn't have the capacity, we showed that they do have capacity and they're carrying those heavy loads even today. And that saved $150 million in 1995, 96 uh, uh, value, which would be now billions. And also it saved the environment because to build a bridge is you use a lot of uh, resources and uh, the carbon footprint in building a bridge is very, very high. So we saved the dollars, economical, the, we saved the dollars, we saved the environment, and we allow the higher mass limits. And uh, that uh, the country got benefited by that because there was a free, uh, no constraints in our network. Okay, thank you, Prashari. We have about another five questions. Hopefully we have enough time, but uh, the next one is, what is the yeah. process in selecting the type of superstructure to use? Example, okay. double T girder versus box girder versus truss, concrete or steel. Yeah, what again, what we do is, what is the best? Now, we have gone away from truss because of uh, maintenance issues, because it is steel. You have either wells or rivets and uh, you have to paint them. So that is why we have gone away from steel. Uh, steel box girder is okay because we have got good um, protection systems now. So protective coatings. So these are the factors. So very rarely we will use these days steel truss bridges. Of course, timber truss is completely out because again, timber is getting very scarce. So either uh, double T is when you want to launch something, it is good. Uh, box girder, I think uh, would be preferable to a double T, but again, depending on the constraint of the site, then you will select a double T as against a box girder if you want to launch something. So it all, it, you have to take, as I said, uh, when it comes to Sri Bridge, we had seven options and we selected this option, but that option had two, balance cantilever plus uh, the uh, the other one was the double T's. Okay. okay, the next question for Kasari is, for the Anza mm -hmm. bridge, how was it determined, uh, uh, how was it determined that the water droplets uh, wa uh, caused the vortex effect? And that caused yeah. this way? Uh, that is where, because the bridge didn't move sideways when there was no light rain, or even if there was light rain and no wind, there was no issue. So these two should occur simultaneously. Having drops on that uh, plastic tube, so the water gets uh, adhered to. And at that time, you have, I, I don't know exactly the velocity of the wind, and it should come in a certain direction. And those two together created a certain frequency for the bridge, which will give a lateral frequency, which is very clear, very near to the natu natural frequency in the lateral direction. Now, you can, you, in fact, we had a problem, I'm bringing, uh, the drawing an analogy. We designed a foot bridge, steel foot bridge near a school. And, uh, and we allowed uh, the disabled people to use, so we had ramps, and they used to use the bridge. This is a foot bridge, steel. And steel um, is generally is not as stiff as concrete, so it tends to vibrate. But what we did was we tend to keep the normal footfall of people outside the natural frequency of the bridge. So when people walk, there is no problem. But the school children had started to jump, like marching. Right, and then when this uh, the handicapped people were using their wheelchairs, they felt and they were scared. Then they they 
uh, they informed us. So what we did was we cut a hole in the bottom flange where the stress was low and put a damper and changed the frequency of the bridge. Even when people, uh, school children, you, you can't police them. When the school children, you know, get a kick out of just, uh, you know, jumping, we made the, their footfall frequency outside the natural frequency of the bridge. And that was it. And we resolved the problem. This Anzac bridge is the same. You get the natural frequency in the lateral direction, then you get a particular rain with a particular wind coming from a particular direction. So once we identify it is the case, when you put these uh, uh, beads or welds around this plastic, it's a plastic bead. Once the drop hits that, it won't get adhered to. It runs down the spiral like a drain. So that changed the uh, the, uh, the the it didn't then after that it didn't match with the natural frequency of the bridge, and also we put a uh, dampers. So two things, rather than the uh, so we which I didn't mention. So we to put the spirals so that the raindrops won't adhere to the plastic tube, and also we uh, put some dampers so that it won't uh, move sideways. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, we have a lot of questions coming in at the moment. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, what are the modern practices adopted in Australia to monitor the bridge structural responses in terms of structural health monitoring? Yes. Um, we have, in fact, uh, we took the initiative we have got certain bridges. We load tested the uh, what we did. The others is we have a certain bridge, and theoretically, when you analyze it, says uh, there there is not enough capacity. So what we did was what are the critical elements in that particular bridge, and we went and put strain gauges on those, uh, and also we set the so. Uh, any type of vehicle that goes uh, will determine the the strain. And also, we the, before the bridge, we put uh, the the on the road approaches uh, some measures. They are also like strain gauges, but they are like a tube. When the vehicle goes over that, that will measure the wheel loads. So before the bridge. Before the truck comes onto the bridge, we had instruments set up to measure the wheel loads. So we know that particular um, vehicle has, um, say, wheel one has X, wheel two has X2, wheel three has X4, and so on and so forth. And when it goes on the bridge, the critical elements, we get the strain. So we can correlate that strain versus the, the type of truck. So, and if that strain is below what we can allow, we can keep on increasing. That And that's the philosophy. That's how we passed the test. Theoretically, because what happens is when you articulate a bridge, theoretically, we can't take all those components into account, but there is load redistribution. There are various road, uh, load paths that we cannot account in the design. But in the real life, there are so many other load paths. So we assume that, okay, so much of width of the deck, the load will come into this particular girder. But you have membrane stresses. So all that will try to distribute better than what we theoretically would assume. Because in the design, we cannot go right to the bare bone. And it's dangerous to do that. It is all the time we should have a factor of safety in our design. Otherwise, you know, the bridges that we were talking about, I said 160 bridges, because there was a concerted built into it, that is why we managed to have those bridges pass for high loads. And there were some where the, in a certain time, people were going for like, there were competitions. 
uh, come up with the slender most structure. But thank God it didn't go for a long time. People realized that's not the path to go. It is good on paper, but uh, for an infrastructure, that's not. You have, look at Sydney Harbour Bridge. We carry eight lanes of traffic and two railway trucks built, built in 92 years ago, still functioning good as gold. So that our forefathers, Dr. Bradfield, had the foresight to design, knowing that Sydney will grow. At that time, you know, people were, in fact, we had to fight with the government to get uh, designed a bridge of that magnitude at that time. But now everybody is grateful for his foresight. Professor Ari, I think we'll take one more question. Yep. Uh, I think uh, this uh, couple of people have asked this question in terms of uh, will there be any new uh, considerations in the design stage due to the recent bridge collapse in the USA, as well as uh, uh, saying that uh, uh, give me a second. Uh, that uh, are there any other factors that impacted the, uh, this collapse? Uh, I think the main factor is the loss of power. So uh, I don't know whether why they couldn't drop the, even the anchors. Probably I think when when they lost the, and I was told by another uh, marine engineer that as soon as the main power goes off, there are other generators that should pick up within four minutes, but it didn't happen. So they lost completely power, and therefore, I don't know whether that even prevented them from dropping the anchors. But, you know, the other is that there would have been, I haven't read anything yet, there would have been currents at that time, such a massive, if there's a drift, there is no way they can stop. There are no brakes like in a car. So that's one thing. And, we, as engineers, we have to take a listen. Normally, we have covered ship impact. What we do is whenever we have a bridge being built or a river or a sea, we have the maritime services. They know what type of boats go. And we ask the question, this bridge is going to be, now for example, uh, a bridge, the Brisbane, the Gateway Bridge, is designed for 300 years, not 100 because it's such an expensive. So the when going underwater, we have to find out within that 300 plus years, can the both sides increase? So they will have some idea. And if it is going over a railway, the same thing. We, we talk to the railway guys and find out are the locomotives going to be bigger than current? So we have to know what size of vehicles or vehicles or trains or boats or ships are going to pass and possible impact on the on the bridge during the life of that particular bridge and then design accordingly and even sometimes the peers cannot be designed to take that force in which case we had to have sacrificial structure built around it and some places i have seen the whole channel is uh, you get a series of fenders built right along the channel. So the boat and that channel is made fairly narrow compared to the width of the the, the span of the, uh, uh, that particular span, river or the, uh, the span in the river, uh, river or the sea is much larger. So two things, if you can avoid, number one, avoid anything in water. And that's what we in Sydney did. We don't have any piers. It's a two-pin arch, and it is anchored well into, into the land in sandstone. And that's number one. If you can avoid, avoid that. The other is, if you want to have, make it as large as possible, the spans, so that you can have make the channel narrower so that there is enough space 
The other is make it more, rather than continuous span, make it simply supported. This, it has other issues. When it is simply supported, then your, your depth of the superstructure will be much larger. But these are the horses for horses. You have to look at all this before you select. So actually, detailed design is not the important one. It is actually the initial, the feasibility study is the most important. Selecting a route and selecting a type of structure, selecting the type of substructure, those are the important things. The rest, computer will do the trick uh, these days. In the olden days, yes, we had to hand calculate and do all that. But now, with the advent of the computer and the software that is available, that is not the important thing. We as engineers, we have to see feasibility study, what type of structures are there, what are the risks that we have, and how do we maintain it, and all that have to be during that lifespan. Can people access to replace bearings? That type of thing. So I hope I covered that question. And if I um, have imparted something, it's a great, I consider it's a great achievement for me.